it's a pleasure to have uh, you uh, joining us. Uh, this is, um, again, a conversation that's extending from uh, our transparency uh, and LGBTQ plus glass art exhibition uh, that is up right now at uh, Museum of Glass. Uh, it originally was at the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia uh, and in 2017, and we now have it here at MOG. Uh, thankfully, uh, this pandemic is ending and people are actually able to come out now and see the exhibition, and uh, we just wanted to be able to talk with the artists about it. So, uh, Joseph, uh, welcome, uh, and uh, let's get started. <laughs> Great to meet you all, and thanks for inviting me. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the first question I have for you is, um, what does it mean to you to be in a show like Transparency that explores the sexual identity of the artist? You know, uh, when I first heard about the show, I think Tim Tate told me about it. Uh, I was excited, but, you know, living in New York, where there's like every other person you meet is either gay or lesbian. It seems pretty lame for a, a, a show to be titled that, but I feel like since the show was in Philadelphia originally, uh, I think it's a little less uh, obvious that there are gay and lesbian artists out there working uh, in glass. So I think it was more like I, I thought about it and I thought that I might be a role model, perhaps, okay. for younger artists that might be a little scared of uh, showing their work and letting people know that they're gay. So I, I thought about it and I had a perfect piece to uh, send in uh, and they, they obviously they liked it. So. It was good, uh, and I, I still feel like just living in a big city like New York, uh, maybe that show wouldn't be as successful, mm. but uh, since it's a traveling show, I, I'm really glad that I, it's going to see and be exposed to more people. That's interesting to, to think about it in that context. Uh, New York might be like a bubble in terms of... Um, just uh, just acceptance of uh, everybody's identity. Uh, and then when you get outside of that area, um, you're, you're still, it's still another world. I, I lived in New York for a while and um, mm -hmm. I, I understand that it's uh, just traveling around. It's different from place to place. Definitely. And it is definitely a bubble and with not just gay and lesbians, but all other aspects of politics and uh, fashion and it's just like we have it all here except uh, bigotry maybe <laughs> right <laughs> exactly right I think I think New York just figures out how to discriminate against people based on income <laughs> more so than anything <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, choice of working in uh, stained glass? And uh, uh, why is that a medium that uh, resonates with you? I, well, originally I was working in publishing. I worked at a, a four, three, three large magazines in New York, uh, People, GQ, and Good Housekeeping. And I, while I was there, I took a bunch of classes at Urban Glass in Brooklyn. And I took one from uh, Klaus Moji, uh, Kazumi Ikamoto, Erica Rosenfeld, and Toby Upton, and uh, actually with uh, Judith Schechter. So I was influenced tremendously by these artists, and I gained a lot of knowledge. And uh, stained glass really has a like friendly appeal to the general public. Uh, they understand it, they see it in churches, they see it in craft fairs. So it was something very friendly that people were not like put off by like performance art or, or something like that. So 
I just like took classes. I opened my own studio and started to explore the techniques and felt like it was missing something. It was missing like sort of a pop art aspect to the imagery. So I was just like, there's a, a opening there for new artwork to make this very old traditional technique uh, fresh. And I, I just dove in and started doing more, more pop art in uh, stained glass. Okay. So um, I'm gonna ask you, I guess, a twofold question. Um, what does Agnes Moorhead mean to you? And uh, does the fact that Agnes Moorhead's career um, when she was uh, on television, particularly on Bewitched, um, um, and the fact that that paralleled when uh, pop art was at its height, uh, did that have something to do with picking this particular icon? Yeah, I, Agnes Moorhead, when I was in fifth grade uh, for Halloween, I actually dressed up as Agnes Moorhead. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes way back. And uh, she, uh, she was thought to be lesbian. And, she, you know, I'm uh, at the very end of the baby boomers. So that whole style for the show, the colors, the pop art uh, decoration scene in the show was, it's like deep in my memory. And she was a character that everybody knew, but she was not like, not like put up on a pedestal as she should have been. So I felt like this was a great, uh, great way to actually remember remind people of her and her personality. And I originally, I did one small piece, uh, and I could show that if you like. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. And I'll make this a uh, the whole screen. So this is a very first piece I did, and it was for an exhibit uh, in a church, actually. <laughs> I yeah, I was so surprised that they accepted. Did you get away with it? <laughs> I got away with it. Yeah, it was a at a church very close to Lincoln Center. And uh, it was for a show that I actually had 10 pieces. I, I'm trying to look up the date that the show was. I think it was back in 2015. So I had 10 pieces and it was about uh, the I, people that had problems that they would bring up in church. Okay. So it was a, basically a addictions. So the name of the show was Deliver Us From Our Addictions. Okay. And I did this piece along with uh, nine other pieces. Here's the uh, installation. And it was right inside of this church. Uh, and the, <laughs> they accepted it. There was one piece that had a swear word in it. And the priest actually put some, uh, some, some black tape over it. But other than that, they accepted it. It was at the Church of St. Paul's here in New York City. Okay. The Lincoln Center. So that's the first time... Agnes Moorhead actually saw saw the light light of day. I uh, I did other addictions like overeating, uh, plastic surgeries. There was like more modern addictions, and I wanted to, it to be serious but also have a 
a bit of humor to it, like the food addictions had the big images of Twinkies in it. So that was the first time I used Agnes Moorhead and she was representing sins, uh, and but also in a comic way. And uh, she was also kind yeah. of like the anti-hero of that show, right? Uh, she was. She was. She was evil, but right. yeah, she was evil to a certain extent. Uh, she she would never kill anybody. She would only play with Darren because Darren had to come back next week in an, another episode. Right. So uh, it was just like she was just uh, really like kidding around, but she she was pretty nasty sometimes. Right. In a humorous way. So uh, I'll show you these images now. This is actually the work being put together. So it's a silk screening on stained glass. And uh, this is the work before I soldered it together. So I had to silk screen. I was, there's probably like over 20 images of her. Cut them out copper foil, and then solder it together. Uh, and the piece is called Cloud of Agnes. And because our character was on the evil side, I, I wanted to make her like into a storm. It just fit perfectly with her character. And I never did a piece with this many images in it. So it was like overwhelming because earlier I did a couple of small pieces with their image in it, but I I felt like the impact, and this is a it's about thirty five inches square, so it was just like really strong and humorous. Uh, once I started soldering it together, there's a piece on my work table. I uh, with all my work I put it in a metal frame with LED lights behind it. So it lights up nice and evenly. Uh, you don't have to put it in a window. So I, it was really nice to actually see the finished work. There's a little color change in it. And there's the final piece. Uh, I was just teaching at Delphi uh, in uh, Lansing, Michigan. And I made a couple of small, like, uh, night lights. That's the image you see on the right. Uh, so she's seen really large, but also, like, really compact, uh, like the image there. Oh, those are crazy. So that's uh, the, the images of, I'll just go back. That started from this original image. That I didn't, I never knew it would like keep on going as a series. That's great. So, uh, stained glass kind of um, it, taken out of a spiritual uh, context, it just kind of uh, starts to um, em embody like importance, uh, you know, in a very secular way. Um, I, I, when I think about uh, art like that, I think about like Andy Warhol, like kind of making those uh, big pictures in the same style as uh, like um, Eastern Orthodox icons. And so like, there's a history in pop art of like taking uh, religion and kind of like secularizing it. Uh, and is that the type of conversation you wanted to be in? Uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, I loved be putting in the category with Andy Warhol, of course. <laughs> I'm not at that level. Right. I actually met him on the street once in New York and uh, in Union Square. So I was like, oh my God. He didn't talk at all. His assistant did all the talking. <laughs> but uh, I feel like his work is more known for the Campbell soup can, but I love when, what he's done to the... Uh, I think he did The Last Supper with all different colors and everything. So I, yeah, I feel like religion uh, is very easy to make fun of. And a lot of artists just go overboard with that. But I love using the 
traditional backlit stained glass to send a message. And it's not religious at all, but people are just drawn to the work. Sometimes they see it from afar and they're like, oh, it's stained glass, it back, it's backlit. And then they get up closer and they see like, it's not your typical stained glass. There's like cartoon characters and uh, movie stars and it just brings it to an unexpected place. Okay. Well, um, some of the work uh, that you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, some of the work you, you have done uh, with a religious scene, a theme could be considered controversial. I'm uh, thinking about uh, the crucifixion of Bart and Lisa. Um, so you, you kind of use these religious motifs and uh, you kind of play with them in ways that uh, are kind of, um, I, I guess, uh, um, deal with uh, taking something holy and turning, on, uh, turning it on its head. Uh, yeah, I've seen uh, some uh, some people react to my Bart and Lisa, the whole Simpson series, uh, in a negative way. But I think that's the role of artists to open people's eyes. Right. But I wasn't planning on it. It was like <laughs> that wasn't sacrilegious to me. Right. I actually did one piece with uh, Bart and Lisa on the cross, and the backstory is. In 2008, there was the whole housing crisis. Okay. I wanted to show, I was searching for an icon that represented America and American families that were suffering through this. Okay. So I was thinking of Ronald McDonald or President Obama at that point. And then I was like, who better to represent uh, America than, than the Simpsons? Right. Well, I put Bart on the cross, and then he felt a little lonely up there, so I added Lisa. <laughs> and uh, it was just like, it came so naturally. Uh, I had the piece out on my light, light table, and the first person to see it was my frame maker. Uh, he stopped over to deliver the frame for it, and he saw it, and he said, you're going straight to hell. And I was like, uh, I never got a re reaction like that from my artwork. And I said to myself, I'm going to make more of these pieces. Right. So I made uh, about six more with the Simpsons series. And I, it was just, it just came out so naturally. And it was fun. And it was like on the edge. So I, I really enjoyed making that series. And I, probably wouldn't have done it without that reaction it's it's funny that you you would do that with the simpsons they're already an irreverent institution and then to take them and then make them more irreverent kind of uh just just pushes the line and so that's kind of what makes it uh, kind of a, a, an amazing uh set of work <laughs> yeah and it was a real challenge because those pieces were like seven layers deep and they were like two by three feet so it was a lot of just like physical work just to put them together. So uh, it was a, I, I love having challenges in my, my artwork. Uh, I think, I think artwork should not only challenge the, the artist, but also challenge the viewer, uh, challenge the viewer about their assumptions, uh, challenge the viewer about uh, their values. Um, and so how do you feel about being a conduit as an artist for the viewer to kind of have these challenging moments? I, I say bring it on. <laughs> you know, when I go to galleries and museums, I, I, I just see work. And if it's like really calm and, you know, I, I like when I see artwork that has a, a story behind it. That's great. And most religious stained glass work has that, but also a uh, controversy. And, and you sort of see how you feel inside when you see the artwork and you think about it more. Like the whole series in the church was based on addictions and I wanted people to see the addiction and maybe relate to it and deal with it. Indeed. Um. 
another question about clouds of Agnes. Uh, what do you think Agnes Moorhead would think of the work? Have you thought about that? <laughs> I think she would. I think she would love it. Uh, but you know, she said in, in interviews, uh, that's the role most people know her from was the TV series. But she was a serious Broadway actor, actress. She was in movies. And people, you know, knew her from that also. But the whole TV series just like wiped all that away. Right. <laughs> and she was known as like uh, Endora. And it's well, like it's ingrained in too popular. You know, getting too popular, you become typecast after a while. Exactly. No. Yeah, but she was a very talented actress. So she might have been like, why didn't you choose another role for me? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so um, what have you been working on lately? Where is your mind going? What uh, has been inspiring you? Uh, can I say something else about the Simpsons work? Oh, sure, please. Because a lot of people uh, always ask about copyright. Okay. Uh, and with the Simpsons piece, I, I actually did it and I was a little nervous about using the imagery, but I made something totally new from, from that series. And after I made six works, I had a show at Urban Glass in Brooklyn. Okay. And it was photographs from it were in uh, the Brooklyn Eagle and a reporter from the, uh, what was the newspaper? The Daily News, the Daily Times in London saw that article and he posted that it on their website and printed it in is issues around the world. So that got out and one of the Simpsons writers saw the image and called me up. And I was like, oh no, I'm really in trouble. And he did his studio visit and he actually came over and bought the work. That's so I feel like it's in a good place. He accepted the work and I don't have to worry about copyright. But I've done other works where I use, uh, I used R. Crumb's illustrations and I asked him for permission to use his artwork. So uh, if it's a small independent artist, I always ask for permission to use their artwork. But I, upcoming events, I'm like fully booked because uh, last year, a lot of my classes were put, put off till this year. I just did a class at Delphi in Lansing, Michigan. I, I actually teach all these processes for painting, silk screening, and airbrushing on stained glass. Okay. So I have classes in Corning, uh, in uh, Penland in North Carolina coming up. Uh, and I, I'm actually doing some paintings too, oil paintings on canvas. So I have two big shows at the end of the year that I have to make uh, about 40 paintings for. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. Uh, one show is in Mar Mesa, Arizona, and the other is in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I also have a residency next year in Finland. Oh, wow. So I'm going to do that for a month and then go teach at a school in Germany called Bildwerk. Okay. So a lot coming up for the next year and a half. Wow. So that, you're hitting the ground running after uh, after the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was great to actually do some really complicated paintings during the last year. But it's so nice to have live classes with my students. It's going yeah. really well. Oh, that's, that sounds great. Um, I, I want to kind of um, open things up for um, people who are watching to ask us some questions. And let's see if they can chime in. Um, um, yeah, so does anybody have any questions? Um, feel free just to put it in the chat and we will try to get to your uh, questions. And one thing I want to mention, because I do come from a graphic design background, okay. uh, I had to design on a deadline 
when you're working in an office and you have to get the issue out. So that was really good training for when I started my glass career. I, I set deadlines for myself and I produced the artwork as quickly but as detailed as I could because I was used to that world of having a, like a show coming up or an issue getting out. It was, it was really good training. Uh, and I find a lot of my students, when I teach a class, we have like maybe four or five days to make a work and they really produced a lot of work during that time. Do you, do you think it's freeing to not necessarily have a deadline? Um, and because you already have this discipline coming from um, a more commercial world, is, is it freeing? Because you're like, wow, I can do a lot now. <laughs> it was, especially when I was working full time and doing my glass work after hours. And then I quit my full time job and I was doing my glass work all day and I got so much more done. It was amazing because before that I would be working on a piece and it would take a whole month because I only worked at night. But then I was like producing like two or three during the month. So it was very, very freeing. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Tim Tate says hi. <laughs> that came through in the chat. <laughs> um. So uh, Tim also asked the question, uh, can you tell us about Josefina Cavallina? Okay, yes. So uh, about a year ago, I did a, a exhibit in Key West of my paintings. Uh, and it was originally going to be a show about my stained glass work, but I started to do oil paintings at that point. And I asked them if they would show my, my paintings and they agreed. So I had never shown oil paintings before. And I had an exhibit, a one man show in Key West, like in eight months and I had to make, uh, I think it was 10 pieces. So I started painting and I felt like this was so different than my glass work. It was more sitting down, you couldn't cut yourself, it was less physical. And I felt like it was like my feminine side. So I created my new identity of Josefina Cavallina, who would be signing these paintings. I was listening to different type of music uh, and just taking my time painting on canvas. It was so different. I felt like a different person. So I'm splitting up my life now in between Joseph and Josephina. Uh, it's, it's really fun. It's meant to be fun. Uh, and I'm not going to, through any transition. <laughs> but I, it's, it just felt like a totally different person making these, these artwork. Uh, and I want to sort of separate that because I, I don't see any overlap with my paintings and my glass work. Okay. Uh, that brings me to another question. So would you consider yourself a, uh, a glass artist or do you consider yourself someone who just uses um, the best medium uh, to bring across whatever the idea is? I... Uh, actually both. <laughs> you know, it's like, depending on the day, I'll be like, oh, I'm a glass artist today. But I, I feel like because I studied art in college, I am more of an artist that works with glass. And I feel like if glass didn't come up in my life, I would be expressing myself in other, an, another medium. So it just happens to be glasses, just a great way of seeing the imagery and the colors are so vibrant. I, I just chose that. But now that I'm doing paintings on canvas, it's, there's some overlap with the, the pop idea, but there's, uh, it's just a different way of seeing, seeing artwork. 
Um, I'm looking to see if we have any more questions. All right, I'm, so I have our tech, our tech uh, team said we don't have any more questions so far. Is there anything else you would like to say before we close, Joseph? It's been really great just to kind of have you talking about your process and your ideas. Um, is there anything you want to say about uh, uh, your work or this exhibition before we close? Uh, yes, because this exhibition started in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and I was really glad that I, Megan Call, who's the uh, exhibition director and curator of that show, uh, put this on. So I want to thank her for organizing that. But she actually bought that piece of artwork. So she like fell in love with it. And I didn't know at that point this would be a traveling show. So uh, it's great that she is letting this go outside of her home and travel around the US. So I, it's always nice to, to see my artwork uh, in different places and be exposed to more people. So uh, I wanted to thank her and thank oh. the people at the Museum of Glass too. Hello? Hello. Um, sorry. My, my uh, audio went out for a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, it's just a, it was a, it's continues to be a great run with the, uh, the show continuing on to other places. Indeed. Well, we are happy that it is here at uh, Museum of Glass Tacoma. Uh, it means uh, a lot that we have it. Um, I personally think that uh, representation matters and to be able to have uh, an exhibition that deals with LGBTQ plus artists in glass specifically, I feel will open up the doors for the next generation. And um, uh, I think this, these talks also help that, um, just kind of give young people insight into the process of an artist. And also um, just to know what it is for to be uh, out and proud with your identity and also having that work with your art. So I think this exhibition is very important. Wonderful. Indeed. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Joseph, uh, for this uh, session of transparent conversations. And please be sure to join us next week on Thursday, same time. Um, is uh, I think I think that's it.